Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, today I'm going to be talking to you about mycobacterium tuberculosis. I'm Dr. Anju Kagal and uh, I really want to emphasize on this topic and go into some details which will help you as clinicians later on in your lives to be able to understand TB. Tuberculosis is a condition which in India is very rampant and we all need to know about how we can prevent, diagnose and control the disease. It is not really new and dates back to 5000 BC when it was found in many archaeological places. Of course, these were discovered recently, but these archaeological places date back to 5000 BC. In 2000 BC, Egypt, Egyptian mummies have shown evidence of tuberculosis. In 500 BC, Hippocrates also mentioned pulmonary thysis. In the year 1500, there were reports of tuberculosis from the European literature. And in 1882, the bacillus was isolated by Robert Koch. So, the disease is not new, it is really old, it is only that it has become very epidemic now in our country. It is an infectious disease caused by an acid fast organism called mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is usually acquired by an inhalation in which case we call it pulmonary tuberculosis. However, when it affects other parts of the body, it is referred to as extra pulmonary tuberculosis. The estimated TB incidence rates, this is a 2016 map from WHO, indicates that India has an incidence of 200 to 299 cases per 100,000 population. If we break it up, it means that 40 percent of our population is infected and approximately there are 15 million cases of TB in our country. You would agree that is a very, very large number. So, before we go on to the organism, I would like to tell you something about TB pathogenesis. Now, usually tuberculosis develops when the immune system cannot handle the bacilli and cannot bring them under control. If they do manage, if the immune system does manage to bring the bacilli under control, the patient lands up with what we call a LTBI that is a latent TB infection. About 10 percent of patients who have LTBI are likely to develop T TB later on whenever their immunity is compromised. Uh, when we inhale the bacteria, the first thing is if your body's immune system is very good, the macrophages are going to ingest the bacilli and destroy them. However, very often the ingested mycobacteria tend to multiply within these macrophages. Eventually, the macrophages may die, they may induce a cell mediated immunity and a granuloma is formed. Now, what does this granuloma consist of? In the center, we have the acid fast bacilli. These are then sur surrounded by epithelioid cells, which are actually activated macrophages, which have ingested the bacilli. These epithelioid cells, they stimulate an immune response and the T cells arrive at the site. These are the 
T lymphocytes. Many of the epithelioid cells will fuse together and give rise to a Langhans giant cell. Now, if you look at the Langhans giant cell, this is a large cell which has a horseshoe shaped nucleus and it is formed by the fusion of macrophages. Surrounding this are fibroblasts and very rarely if the infection is not contained, this central po portion undergoes caseation. So, let us come back to the AFB in the alveoli which have proliferated and a granuloma is formed. Now, this granuloma formation limits the primary infection and the lesion becomes quiescent. This lesion is surrounded by fibroblasts which then produce the dense scar tissue which then becomes calcified and you get the appearance of a gons focus which is usually subplurally arranged. Now, this is what is seen in most children. If the uh, regional lymph nodes have got enlarged, then together with this gons focus, we call it a gons complex. Um, so, I hope now you understood the concept of the gons focus and the gons complex. Now, it is here that the mycobacteria lie latent and this occurs in about 80 to 90 percent of individuals and we say that all these people have got latent TB infection. Now, in about 5 to 10 percent of these patients, whenever their immunity drops, there is likely to be a reactivation of this focus and then they suffer from what we call a post primary tuberculosis. So, now let us look at the ones who get a primary tuberculosis. 10 to 20 percent of patients develop a progressive primary tuberculosis. Now, over here what happens is that the bacilli are present in the alveoli, they will multiply and a cavity forms. Now, within this cavity as the bacilli keep multiplying, the alveolar ma macrophages will produce proteases and these proteases cause liquefaction what was demonstrated to you as caseation. And as this little cavity grows, sometimes it ruptures into the bronchus and releases this caseous material as well as throws out the acid fast bacilli. Now, patients who have progressive primary TB are the ones who have now become infectious. These are the ones we have to be careful about because they can spread the infection. Now, if this progressive primary tub tuberculosis goes unchecked, then the disease the by bacteria can spread hematogenously. They are remember I told you that they have the ability to live within the macrophages. So, the you know when they are ingested by the macrophage you get a phagosome, they resist destruction by the lysosomal enzyme and so they remain within the phagosome and they multiply. Now, this is then carried to different parts of the body and the patient can land up with extra pulmonary tuberculosis or miliary tuberculosis. Extra pulmonary tuberculosis is usually restricted to one part of the body and as you can see in this picture, it does not spare any organ. It can involve the central nervous system where you have meningitis or a tuberculoma, involve the lymph nodes, the pericardium, the genitourinary system, bone marrow, skin, bone and joints, gastrointestinal tract, adrenals and even the eyes. But when the disease spreads all over the body, then we refer to it as miliary tuberculosis. So, let us see a case. Najma is a 32 year old female who presented with cough since 4 weeks. She had weight loss of 15 pounds over the last 1 month, night sweats and subjective fever. 
she complained that this fever usually rose in the evenings. Despite treatment with erythromycin, her cough and fever progressively got worse. She now complained of bringing out blood stained sputum. On examination, she had rales in the right upper region of the chest. She had axillary lymph adenopathy and her x-ray chest showed a right upper lobe infiltration. All right. So, now when you have a patient like this, how would we investigate her? The first thing we would do in such a patient is to collect a sputum sample. Now, remember in microbiology sample collection is very, very important and therefore, it becomes necessary that at, at all stages we explain to the patient what exactly we want from him. So, you have to first like Najma would be told that you need to collect an early morning sample. When you get up in the morning, you ask the patient, do you get a lot of sputum, which could be bulgum or bedka or whatever depending on which part of the country you are located in. All right. Most of the times the patient would say that the amount of sputum which he spits out is more early in the morning. Then you ask the patient to rinse her mouth and after rinsing her mouth, ask her to collect a sample from deep down in the chest. All right, You have to explain to the patient that they have to bring out sputum and we are not interested in the saliva. All right. Now, this sample has to be collected in a sterile container, which is usually a wide mouth container. 3 to 5 ml quantity will give you a good sputum sample. After this, we move on to the laboratory diagnosis. Now, after collecting Najma's sputum sample, if for some reason we had difficulty in getting a good sputum sample from her, we may have tried to induce the sputum or if necessary done a bronchoalveolar lavage. Now, this sputum sample when it is received in the laboratory, we would stain by the Zeal Nielsen method or fluorescent stain. After that, the sputum sample would have to be cultured for which we would do concentration and decontamination methods. Culture is by the conventional method takes almost 4 to 6 weeks. These are being replaced by molecular methods like PCR and gene expert. Sensitivity testing is done by conventional methods that is the proportion method replaced by liquid cultures nowadays and even better are the molecular methods like the gene expert which gives you results in 2 hours and the line probe assay which gives results in a day. Animal pathogenicity tests earlier were always used somehow to prove the Cox postulates, but nowadays this is of historical importance. Let us move on to microscopy. The sputum smears are stained by the zeal milson method or by the Kenyan's cold stain method. In the zeal nielsen method, we take carbolfuxin which binds to the mycolic acid in the cell wall of the mycobacterium tuberculosis and once it is bound over there, it resists decolorization by 20 to 25 percent of sulfuric acid. The counter stain which is commonly used is methylene blue and what you look for are 3 to 0.3 micrometer size bacilli, slender bacilli which are often beaded single or may be present in clusters against a blue background. All right. Now, when you do the conventional zeal nielsen stain, after you pour the carbolfuxin, you have to heat the stain so that it can penetrate the bacteria. In the Kenyan's cold stain modification, the amount of carbolic acid 
in the carbolfuxin stain is higher therefore, we do not need to heat the carbolic acid all right the carbolfuxin is really strong. So, the organism is non motile non sporing and non capsulated. Now, what is the disadvantage of microscopy? You need to have at least 5000 to 10000 AFB per ml and in children the elderly and HIV infected patients because the immune response may not be so good you may not be able to see the bacilli at all. In addition microscopy can produce a lot of subjective errors. Now, this microscopy when we do it the sputum is graded as per the RNTCP guidelines and if you look at the right hand column you will see the number of fields which need to be examined. So, usually we have to examine at least 100 fields which can be very tedious when you are doing it under the oil immersion lens. If there are more than 10 AFB per oil immersion field we give it a 3 plus grading 1 to 10 per oil immersion field is 2 plus 10 to 99 per 100 field is 1 plus 1 to 9 per 100 fields we call it scanty and we have to give the exact number of bacilli and you have to examine at least 100 fields and no AFB in 100 fields is negative. Believe me if you are sincere it takes approximately 20 minutes to scan one smear. So, what is the alternative? If you want to hasten it you can detect the AFB by fluorochrome strain. You, we usually use the oromine O or the oromine rhodamine combination and the fluorescent dye binds to the mycolic acid which is present in the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, the advantage of doing a fluorochrome strain is that you can look for bright yellow bacilli against a dark background and you can look at this smear under high power field. So, what happens is that it becomes easier to examine the smear because you can see a larger area at one time since you are looking at it under high power. The fluorescent microscope is very expensive 6 to 8 lakhs for a fluorescent microscope and therefore, today this has been replaced by the light emitting diode. This is an objective which has this facility without a fluorescent microscope you can look at fluorescent stained smears. So, we now move on to sputum concentration methods. Now, usually in the past we used to do methods which killed the bacilli and the methods which allowed the bacilli to remain viable. This was done killing the bacilli was done when we wanted to do only microscopy. The advantage was that it did not remain infectious, but today any time when we are processing mycobacteria we have to work in a class 3 biosafety hood all right. Now, we do methods which allow the bacteria to remain viable because not only can we do a smear examination we can also grow the organism and the various methods which I used is the Petroff's method, the NALC NaOH method that is N acetyl cysteine NaOH method and the oxalic acid method. NALC that is N acetyl cysteine is a very good mucolytic and what happens when we do this these concentration methods is that one thing is we decontaminate and get rid of the bacteria other than mycobacterium tuberculosis which are also present in the sputum. The NALC help in dissolving the mucoid sputum. So, you get homogenization and the bacteria after you centrifuge this the deposit which is obtained has concentrated bacilli in it. Once the sample has been concentrated and decontaminated the next step is to culture the organism. Now, the gold standard for culturing organism is done on Lovenstein Jensen medium. 
Why do we need to culture it? It takes almost 4 to 6 weeks for the organism to grow on this medium. However, the advantage of growing it on this medium is that we can uh, identify the organisms based on the colonial morphology. In addition, these same colonies can be subjected to biochemical tests for the identification of the organism and drug susceptibility testing can also be done. So, the two types of media which are generally used for cultivating organisms are the solid media and the liquid media. And I am going to just tell you about the egg containing medium which is the Lovenstein Jensen medium which has stood the test of time and is still used. Coming to the liquid media, we have the Dubois's liquid media, the Middlebrook 7 H 9 medium and it is this Middlebrook 7 H 9 medium which is conventionally used nowadays for liquid culture. Now, the advantage of growing it on a liquid media is that growth occurs faster. So, let us look at LJ medium. This is an egg based medium to which mineral salts 5 percent glycerol and malachite green have been added. The glycerol is hygroscopic and therefore, prevents drying of the medium. Malachite green is a selective agent and inhibits bacteria other than mycobacterium. The egg and the mineral salt of course, provide nutrition for the growth of the organism. At the end of 4 to 6 weeks, you will see dry rough buff tough colonies with a wrinkled surface. They are non emulsifying, they grow very slowly have a generation time of 14 to 15 hours and in terms of actual time they take 4 to 6 weeks to grow. The medium is very laborious to prepare, but like I told you the advantage is that we can see a good growth and identify the organism. Now, why am I emphasizing on this 4 to 6 weeks? Tomorrow when some of you become clinicians and you send a sputum sample for TB culture, unlike bacterial culture where you would get the results in 72 hours, here you find that the microbiologist just has not sent the report and you wonder whether he has forgotten about the culture. So, be patient it takes 4 to 6 weeks for it to grow on solid media. Solid culture methods have now been replaced in many places by automated culture methods which use liquid culture and over here you can process all types of samples. Actually all types of samples can be processed and grown in LJ medium also. The two commonly used automated culture methods are midget and Bacti alert which have been manufactured by different companies. And basically here you have a liquid culture which is inoculated and it is put into the drawers in these machines and left for incubation and mycobacteria can grow within 5 to 14 days. So, this just shows you the mycobacterium growth indicator tube. On the right you can see the tubes and the basic principle is that there is a quenched fluorescent dye which is present at the bottom of the tube. As the oxygen in the media gets used up this fluorescent dye gets is revealed. The machine picks it up and once you get a beeping it will tell you exactly which tube has shown the growth. You can take it out as I said usually growth occurs 5 is a little too early, but 10 to 14 days definitely you would get a growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, I told you that we need to identify the organism and therefore, once we have got growth of the organism we can perform the niacin and the nitrate tests. These two tests are the common tests which will identify mycobacterium tuberculosis which is positive for the niacin as well as positive for the nitrate reduction test. The other biochemical tests which are performed are the catalase, the peroxidase and the aryl sulfatase test. 
these are the various biochemical tests which are performed on the colonies to identify the bacteria. Molecular methods like PCR, line probe assay and gene expert are now gradually replacing the culture methods. These tests detect the DNA of the bacteria and can also detect the genes which cause resistance. All right. But the only disadvantage of these molecular methods is that they pick up viable as well as DNA which is released by dead bacilli. And so, you are not really sure whether the patient is harboring dead bacilli or whether the patient has live bacilli. But like I said, the ease of performing these tests PCR has now been replaced by the gene expert method. Now, the gene expert method is a fully automated self contained system where it detects mycobacterium tuberculosis as well as rifampicin sensitivity. So far it has been approved only for sputum samples though many laboratories are now using it for extra pulmonary samples also. And the results are available within 2 hours. We do not need too much training to perform this, all you need is a good electrical supply. So, basically in the gene expert this is what the machine looks like what you can see in the center and this is how the test is performed. So, there is a liquid which has been provided we take the sputum sample and mix it with this liquid. Then about 2 milliliters of that is transferred into this cartridge which is then placed in the machine. After 2 hours you will get you will get a graph which will tell you whether mycobacterium tuberculosis is present or absent and whether it is present in high amounts, medium amounts or low amounts and it will also tell you whether the strain is susceptible or resistant to rifampicin. So, let me go back to the timeline which I started the lecture with fast forward to the 20th century. In 1921 BCG was first used to vaccinate against tuberculosis. In 42 to 53 streptomycin, INH and PASS were discovered for the treatment of tuberculosis. Rifampicin was also discovered earlier, but came into use in 1965. In 1993, with the HIV pandemic, WHO declared a TB global emergency because the number of cases of tuberculosis really increased because there were so many immunocompromised patients. 1997 was the first time when WHO reported the first case of multi drug resistant tuberculosis and in 2006 the first report of extensively drug resistant TB was reported and in 2012 newer drugs like bedaquiline, delmonid and protomonid have been available for the treatment and today these uh, drugs are also used in tuberculosis for the XDR patients. So, what is drug resistant tuberculosis? So, multi drug resistant tuberculosis is resistance to two of the most commonly used drugs for tuberculosis and that is isoniazid and rifampicin. Now, usually an organism which is resistant to rifampicin is also resistant to isoniazid and therefore, rifampicin resistance is used as a surrogate marker for multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Extensively drug resistant tuberculosis or XDR is defined when the bacilli are resistant 
to any fluoroquinolone. Now, these are the second line drugs which are used. So, MDR patients are given a combination of fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides and if the organism develops resistance to a fluoroquinolone and any one of the injectable drugs that is capriomycin, canamycin or amikacin together with isoniazid and rifampicin, then we label the isolate and XDR isolate. So, the conventional method of doing drug susceptibility testing is the one using LJ medium, a solid medium on which we have different methods of which the proportion method is the most commonly used gold standard for DST. This is followed by the absolute concentration method or by the resistance ratio method. So, over here what is done is different concentrations of the drugs. Now, which are the first four drugs which are used in the treatment of tuberculosis? We have streptomycin, we have INH, we have rifampicin and we have ethambutol. All right. Now, instead of streptomycin, we are using pyrazinamide. All right. Now, what happens over here is that we take different concentrations of the drug and we add a known quantity of the bacilli and then we look to see if the bacilli resist the organism and can grow. But th the time required to get results is 42 days. Now, the same test when it is done in liquid culture like in the midget gives you results within 21 days and the gene expert gives you rifampicin susceptibility or resistance within 2 hours. So, that is very clear what would be the equation what one would want to use when one wants a quick diagnosis. The line probe assay is another molecular test which has been found to be very useful for the detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis and for detecting mutations which cause drug resistance for both the first and the second line anti tubercular drugs. The test is usually performed on growth of mycobacterium tuberculosis and can also be done directly on sputum samples which have 3 plus grading where the organism has been seen by microscopy. Animal pathogenicity tests more of historical importance guinea pigs are inoculated subcutaneously, a local ulcer forms and there is progressive weight loss. After 6 weeks there may be a caseous lesion at the site of inoculation. If the animal is sacrificed you will find that the lymph nodes are enlarged and caseous and tubercles will be seen in the spleen, liver and peritoneum and somehow the kidneys are unaffected. So, so far we have looked at all the direct methods of seeing the bacilli, growing the bacilli and doing drug susceptibility testing. Now, let us look at some indirect methods for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Now, these tests only diagnose latent infection. Remember I told you what a latent infection was? You have inhaled the bacilli, they are present in your body, but the infection has been contained. All right. So, the two common tests are the tuberculin skin test and the interferon gamma release assays. The tuberculin skin test is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction type 4 reaction which I am sure all of you all are aware of. So, in this the antigen which is used is the purified protein derivative and 0.1 ml which corresponds to 5 T units is inoculated intradermally in the flexor aspect of the forearm. After 72 hours you look for the formation of erythema and induration. Now, it is important that when you are measuring you measure the induration and not the erythema. If the size of this induration is more than 5 millimeter in contacts or immunosuppressed individuals it is of significance. A more than 10 millimeter increases 
risk of disseminated disease or high risk of exposure to TB. All right. So, those who have a diameter of more than 10 millimeters are at an increased risk for disseminated disease and high risk of exposure to TB that is what they demonstrate that you have been exposed to TB. The induration of more than 15 millimeters in an immunocompetent adult means that this individual needs to be examined further and followed up to see whether he develops tuberculosis. The use of the tubercle and skin test is to diagnose infection in infants, to determine the prevalence of infection in a community or it can also indicate successful vaccination. All right. Now, see we are all likely to have a positive TST because we have at some time or the other in our lives been exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Whether it is in the bus in which we were traveling or when we were walking on a crowded street, anybody who is coughing and has and is an open case of tuberculosis can transmit the infection. But when we are when our body immune system is good, we contain that infection. False positive, false negative TST results are seen in miliary tuberculosis, in early stages of tuberculosis, in advanced TB, in immunocompromised hosts who do not have a good cell mediated immunity, in severe malnutrition or when the technician has not been able to inject the purified protein derivative properly. False positive results are seen in patients who will be having a atypical mycobacterial infection. The interferon gamma tests, the EGRAs, these are the tests which calculate the amount of interferon which is produced by previously sensitized lymphocytes. Now, what is done basically is that lymphocytes are taken from an individual and these are then exposed to specific protein antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis. The ones which are the most common are the ESAT6 and the CFP10 and if there is proliferation of the lymphocytes, there will be production of interferon which is then picked up. Now, the two commercially available, available tests are the quantiferon TB gold test and the TB spot test. Again, these tests will only pick up whether you have a latent TB infection, which in our country most of us will be having. Serological testing is a big no. Antibody detection tests are of no use in tuberculosis where cell mediated immunity is the main immune response which is stimulated. Now, a little bit about the treatment of tuberculosis. In the past treatment for tuberculosis uh, lasted for about 18 months, then it was brought down to 9 months and after a big trial in Chennai, we started using what is known as DOTS that is directly observed short term therapy. Now, in this particular method of treatment, the period of treatment is for 6 months and at the beginning of the treatment, two sputum samples are collected from the patient, microscopy is performed. If the sample is positive, uh, then the treatment is started. In case the sample is not positive and the patient has been suffering from cough for more than two weeks which has not responded to erythromycin and has x-ray findings suggestive of tuberculosis as was seen in Najma's case, we would also start the treatment. Now, the treatment consists of giving an induction phase or what is also known as the intensive phase where four drugs are given, the isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide and ethambutol. In some patients, we may need to give injectable streptomycin. Now, this induction phase is for a period of 2 months, following which the patient is again asked to give two sputum samples for microscopy. 
Now, if the bacteria have disappeared from the sputum, it is very good because it means that the patient is responding to therapy. In case the bacteria have not disappeared, but the grading has lessened, then also we are happy because the patient is obviously responding to therapy. So, then now the patient is put on a continuation phase where we give rifampicin and INH for a period of 16 weeks, 4 months. Immunoprophylaxis BCG or the Basil Comet Guarin vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. A single dose is given to all babies immediately after birth in our country, and this is given intradermally. It provides immunity for up to 10 to 12 years. It sometimes it does not provide complete immunity, but it definitely reduces the intensity of the infection. The other advantage of giving the BC vaccine is that it gives protection against leprosy, leukemia and severe form of tuberculosis. The adverse effects are local adverse effects where you can get abscess or ulcer formation, regional where lymph, lymph nodes are enlarged and finally, you can also get systemic symptoms like fever and otitis media. It is contraindicated in patients with AIDS because it is after all a live attenuated vaccine, infants born to mother with active tuberculosis, individuals with viral infection like measles, children living with active TB and HIV positive who are in contact with an active case of TB. So, what do we do with these individuals? How are we going to prevent TB in these individuals? This can be done by chemoprophylaxis, where a daily dose of isoniazid 5 milligram per kg body weight is given to persons with latent TB who are at a high risk for developing the disease, infants of mothers with tuberculosis and children and HIV positive patients who have household contacts who are suffering from tuberculosis. Coming to the role of the laboratory in the revised national tuberculosis program. Over the years, the laboratory, the first role of the laboratory was just to perform microscopy. But as the number of cases of multi drug resistance have been increasing, so we went through a phase where every patient who was not responding to treatment their sputum was sent for culture. Once the sputum was cultured on LJ medium which took 4 to 6 weeks, it was then subjected to a sensitivity testing which took another 8 weeks. And so, at the end of 8 weeks you got to know whether the sorry not at the end of 8 weeks, but at the end of 14 weeks you got to know whether the patient was suffering from drug resistant tuberculosis or not. And in the meantime, if he did have drug resistant tuberculosis, he was spreading these resistant bacilli in the population. So, now with the gene expert, which gives you results within 2 hours, you can diagnose whether a patient has got mycobacterium tuberculosis and whether it is resistant to rifampicin and if so, these patients are immediately started on the second line drug treatment. All right. So, this prevents them from spreading the infection to others. The resistance Peter sputum is also sent for LPA, where you can detect the exact genes which are responsible for the resistance. So, the advantage of gene expert is that it detects TB, presence of TB and rifampicin sensitivity within 2 hours. Minimum training is required and there is reduced subjective human error, which was seen with microscopy. So, to summarize the sample, which you will collect in the case of pulmonary tuberculosis, in the case of Najma, she could bring out a good sputum sample and so we collected sputum. If she had had difficulty bringing out the sputum sample, we may have had to do a bronchoalveolar lavage or even uh, do methods, which would uh, induce sputum by, by using saline. Microscopy can be done by Ziel-Nielsen method or the fluorescent stain. 
the advantage of fluorescent stain is that you can see large field in less time and the fluorescent mycobacteria against a black bi background are very easy to pick up. And the other advantage is that this fluorescent stain smear can also be stained by Zn method and you can counter check by the Zn method whether they are really acid fast bacilli present or not. Gene expert was performed for Najma, but because she had rifampicin resistance we also did concentration and decontamination with the NALC and NOH method and culture was done on the conventional LJ method medium. So, in this session I have mainly covered pulmonary tuberculosis. So, thank you for your patient hearing.